to another episode of Reclaim You. Today, Laura and I are talking about a topic that pretty much mostly everyone we talk to could benefit from, I think, and, and that's how to cope with weight gain. So, hey, Laura, how you doing? I am good. Good, good to be here. Yeah. So I was um, kind of looking at the back end of our website, and I noticed that one of the blogs on the website that gets probably the most traffic is how to cope with weight gain. Mm -hmm. And it's it's quite a journey to cope with weight gain. So I thought it would be just an important conversation to have because those of us who are in recovery have to, for the most part, you know, figure out a way to be with their bodies as our bodies change. Yeah, the one thing none of us wants to talk about, but we all really need to. Mm -hmm. I guess, where should we start in all of this? Because it feels like such a, such a big one. Maybe the place to start is to just, it's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. The odds are it's going to happen. So if we can first step in there Mm -hmm. yeah, and anything that we might engage in, in order to not make it happen, is not conducive is not that's not recovery work that's going back to old ways that's giving into the diet culture into the eating disorder symptoms and thoughts and feelings and it's really it's a process i mean i don't i think it's a continuing process it's a daily process of saying okay like weight gain or my body changing, you know, if that feels a little easier to, to accept at first, that as I heal, no doubt my body will change because for years I have been in a relationship with my body where it's been completely neglected in a lot of ways, um, where it's been my enemy and I've wanted to do it harm. And so to, we don't, we don't just one day decide, okay, I'm healed. Mm-hmm. I'm done. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, those of us who are in recovery for a long time still, because we, you can't go out the door of your house. I mean, you go out the door of your house, you step into diet culture, you go on your phone, you step into diet culture, you turn on the TV, you step into diet culture, you, you open a magazine. Like there's nowhere that is completely, I think, safe of diet culture besides maybe a really good support group, um, a really good therapist and dietitian. We encounter these things each and every day. And I think the part of the healing process is just creating a nice, uh, creating an inner dialogue, sort of like a reminder to ourselves that this is part of this process and coming to a place of, and this is okay. I can, it can still suck, right? It totally sucks. Yeah. And I think it's a both and, you Mm -hmm. know, this totally sucks and it's okay because this is in service to my healing, which is most important. Yeah. And it's so true that for, I guess, generally most people, that process of regaining weight or gaining weight or allowing your body to change and, you know, do what it needs to do Mm -hmm. does lead to freedom in lots of ways. And it's still really hard because of the culture that we live in, because of beliefs that we've been conditioned Mm -hmm. to hold on to, that weight gain is bad, that fat is bad, all of these things. And, you know, there can be freedom around food and living your life on your own terms. For sure. And eventually our hope, I think, in working with others and certainly I can say my own lived experience has been that eventually that part of us that continues to scream, my body is only, or I'm only good if I lose weight. I'm only good if my body is smaller. I'm only good if I'm thin. Eventually that part, you know, we, we do a lot of healing with that part and it's not that we push it away and oust it. It's that we come into relationship with it um, and honor that it's there, but there's this larger part of us that we develop in recovery that is able to respond with compassion to that Mm -hmm. part of us Mm -hmm. and to show up and to say, Hey, I get it. However, this feels really good to not have to worry about food all the time. It feels really good to not put my life on hold. Mm -hmm. It feels really good 
to wear clothes that fit me and not give a shit what's on the tag of them in terms of size, right? Um, to not have to squeeze myself into a pair of jeans because it says a certain number. And it feels really good to have space for me and for relationship and for joy that used to be taken up by this weight focused, thin focused part of me that never felt satisfied, no matter how much weight I lost. I mean, that, that part's never going to be satisfied. Right. Yeah. That's such an important point. I think that we can probably speak to that ourselves and lots of our, the folks that we work with say that of like, I look back in three years ago and I think like, oh my gosh, I wish that I had that body then. And at that point, looking back three years prior to that and saying, oh my gosh, I wish I had that body then. It's never enough, right? The weight loss is never enough. The body is never enough, which points us to a larger piece of the work of if it's not about the body, what could it possibly be about? Right? Exactly. Yeah. It's not, you know, this is the focus, the eating disorder symptoms, you know, they are symptoms. They, I think they, to me, that's, information that points us toward there is something greater going on here. And for some of us, it's eating disorder symptoms that we begin to engage in, in order to distract us from whatever the core issue is in mm-hmm. order. It's a, it's a way that we cope. It's a way that we survive. And, you know, in our practice, we really work at the intersection of eating disorders and trauma. It's not just bodily trauma, right? Like it can be trauma on so many different levels Mm -hmm. um, and in so many different ways. And eating is the one thing that I can control. Mm -hmm. Exercise is the one thing I can control. Mm -hmm. And so before I know it and without really even thinking about it much, you know, I don't think any of us makes the conscious decision to, 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 I'm going to have an eating disorder. Like I decided that's what I want for my life. Right. Mm -hmm. But over time and with the encouragement, if you will, of diet culture, um, we find ourselves in the throes of starving ourselves, binging, Mm -hmm. purging, Mm -hmm. over-exercising and, and, you know, all the symptoms that we talk about when it comes to this. Yeah. Yeah. And And, sometimes I think ourselves the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think what's hard sometimes is when when you gain weight, in some ways, you do feel more of your body, right? You feel yeah. more. It feels different. It doesn't feel familiar. And, you know, eating disorders, they're, they're numbing, right? They're numbing mechanisms. They mm-hmm. disconnect us. And this this kind of invitation to feel more, whether mm-hmm. that's feel more of your body or feel more of your emotions, can just feel so destabilizing that it's like, I can't do this, combined with the belief of like, gaining weight is bad, fat is bad, all of these things, it can be like, ah, I'm out. Like, I can't do this. I have to go back to not feeling, you know? Which I think in part speaks to, you know, why we see so much recurrence of eating disorders, right? Like the people, you know, they get in recovery and then go back out into the world, maybe don't continue to get as much support as they need or what have you, or something else comes up in life. Some, you know, someone dies, some trauma happens, there's major stress in one's life, whatever it is, you know, can lead us back to those symptoms because they're familiar and we're so habitually, um, you, you know, we're habitually using them for so long that to slip back into them is a lot easier than we'd like to admit. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I think over time, there's a lot more space. There's a lot, there's a larger zone of tolerance and of insight and space and just awareness that we have to say, Ooh, I'm feeling this, like this is coming up in me, but that's a, that's a long haul of recovery, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, I worked, I worked in substance abuse, counseling for years. And, you know, this idea that like recovery is not just a once and done thing. Recovery is a choice each and every day. And I think it, it, it's here too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's not to discourage people because like, I think sometimes we talk about that and people are like, Oh my God, like, like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to, um, I get it. it. It's more like, think about waking up each day and you get to empower yourself to reclaim your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's why we're here. We, we want to help people with that. And we're here because we all have worked on that in our own ways. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it feels like a lot of times the first step in this is even just like accepting that you don't want to gain weight, mm -hmm. right? Like instead of and warring against yourself, like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I suck because I can't accept this or, you know, what's wrong with me? Why can't I, you know, to accept, man, I really don't want to accept that I'm going to gain weight. That feels yeah. really hard. That feels really yeah. uncomfortable. And like sitting mm -hmm. in some of the discomfort of that, which again, like sitting in the discomfort is uncomfortable and it's hard and it doesn't mean anything about you, right? There's no moral judgment against it. It's just that we live in an obsessed world, an obsessed world mm -hmm. of thinness. Like you said, there's diet culture everywhere we turn. A lot of times family of origins weren't safe spaces for bodies to exist in. So it mm -hmm. makes sense why you wouldn't want to. Yeah. And that's, I think, often where we start with folks is just sitting in that discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I remember, you know, my own journey of recovery and just as a therapist and working with others in recovery, whether it be substance abuse, eating disorders, what have you, you know, when people enter into the process, often the question is, well, how long is this going to take, right? Uh -huh. Like how many sessions? Like, yeah. Like, especially how many sessions or like, especially if they're going into a higher level of care, like, well, how long do I have to be here? Like, and, uh -huh. and I get that. I've been there myself, but this is not a process that we jump into and things happen quickly. This is, this is an un, un, it's unraveling a lot of years of stuff that's been like, you know, that we've been wrapped up in and trying to make sense of it. And the first step is just being able to be in our bodies a little, and we mm -hmm. might not be able to tolerate that for very long, but in the room, when we're sitting with our therapist we can start to create uh, as therapists, we can start to create that safe space for people to begin to drop into their bodies and just sort of, okay, like I'm safe right now. And then, mm -hmm. okay, when you're ready, let's move on out of it. And we, we have to build up that tolerance. Yeah. And then the other work as well, we do. You know, it's a both and. Yeah. And it, you know, it feels important to, and it, maybe folks who are listening haven't maybe heard of, you know, fat phobia or internalized anti-fat bias. And, just knowing that that's a thing, you know, to put some words around being phobic of being fat. And again, without mm -hmm. judgment, because we all have some fat phobia, right? And it's, it's a lot of work to unravel that and to see how much of that still kind of like remains inside mm -hmm. and to do that with lots of grace and compassion for yourself. Because again, the culture that we live in just promotes it. To put some words to it of, oh, right, this is what this is. This is some internalized phobia of, you know, being in a larger body, of being fat, of gaining fat, of being seen as fat, because that would mean X, Y, and Z to me. For sure. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's such a really good point. I think that uh, the word fat, right? Mm -hmm. Like to even like say that word for many people, it takes a while to get there, but this does live in us. And I work with folks around it to say, like, let's think of this, you know, we do a lot of parts work too, but like, if you, you imagine this as a part of you that has been present to try and protect you, but in like mm -hmm. this sort of, you know, this very dysfunctional way. And how do we have compassion and like appreciation for the fact that this part was there for us at times when we were struggling at times when we didn't know any other way, maybe that's an easier way to begin to sit with that part mm -hmm. and honor that it's there. And then eventually being able to call it what it is, right. And see how it is no longer needing to act in the way that it once did, you know, like you can have a break now and I get yeah. every once in a while you're going to come and that's going to be a little sign that I need to come back to my center and like find my way. But yeah, internalized fat phobia is, is so common. And, and I think too, it goes hand in hand. You know, the one thing I thought about was so often we're also working with like issues of perfectionism, uh -huh. right? And so that for me, even to admit that I have this internalized fear of fat, that's not okay. Uh huh. Right. Especially if I'm in recovery and I want to be a good, you know, a good client, I'm not going to bring that up when my therapist, I'm not going to talk about that. Like uh -huh. bring it up, talk about it. It needs to be talked about because it's, if not, it's lurking in the background. Right. And until we call, until we call that out and until we begin to sit with it and work with it, it's going to continue to get in the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of times there's so much judgment against 
yourself for, you know, having beliefs around the word fat, because then what does that mean about me thinking about other people? And if I think yep. that about other people, then I must be awful and terrible mm -hmm. and right. Like then it ties into mm -hmm. worthiness and lovability mm -hmm. and, you know, worthy of being with people and connection. So it can get so deep, but to mm -hmm. acknowledge and to accept like, yeah, I do have these beliefs about what it would mean. I do have these beliefs even about other people sometimes, you know, sure. in, in a safe space, it can just, there can be some like exhale around it of you didn't create this at all. This was planted. Yeah. 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 Planted and, and unfortunately nurtured and to become this terrible life draining weed that just takes over one's life. Right. It's like poison ivy. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, poison ivy, I guess has its benefits. This doesn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Although one could argue, you know, it was trying to have benefit when sure. it was showing up, but I mean, that's like getting at a different level of this that maybe we don't need to. Yeah. Let's just, let's just own it, call it out and, and let's sit with that and get comfortable with that. And we'll make space for other healing and healed parts of us to, to have more of a presence. But so often people are like, I just want this to go away. I just don't, I want it to not exist. Well, I mean, of course, that's why we've been numbing out all these years. Right. Now we're not going to be doing that. And it's hard. It's hard. I mean, to stop using symptoms is really hard, especially because yeah. now we're looking at stuff that is really difficult. And I don't have the, the tools that I knew how to use all these years. So we have to create new ones. Mm -hmm. And I always say to my clients, listen, like if we have a especially challenging session around, you know, a topic that is really just triggering in a lot of ways, that's really causing a lot of upheaval internally. You know, I always say to them, listen, I don't want you to be surprised if you have the urge to use symptoms mm -hmm. between now and next session. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that that's okay. And we talk about why that is. And, you know, this is where you can practice your tools, use some other interventions. And at the end of the day, if you use symptoms, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to be honest about that with yourself and with me, mm -hmm. because then we have something to work with. If you're not honest about that, you know, that's going to always be taking away from this work you're trying to do here in session. Right. Right. It's like that shame is like lurking, lurking yeah. in the background, which is again, related to body, which is related to gaining weight, right? There's so much shame around it. And then keeping secrets because what will, what would you, will you think of me knowing that I'm not like doing this the way I quote unquote should, or whatever that looks like for people. Uh, the yeah. shame again, can be C stabilizing. The same with the scale, right? Like, so one of the things mm -hmm. when we comes to weight gain that we talk about is, is like, you know, weighing oneself, right? Which for so many of us is this ritual that we've uh -huh. engaged in for years, right? And like, you know, in, in recovery programs, in in one of the activities that's often a part of that is is some activity where we get rid of the scale, right? Like sometimes we're smashing the scale mm -hmm. in some programs. Sometimes we're repurposing it in some way. But even if you're not stepping on that scale and it's still in your space, even if it's pushed under something where you can't see it every day, it's still lurking too. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like there are times when my scale's like, hello, right? If I, when I, I had exist. it here, right? I exist. Because it took me a while to get rid of it when I was first in recovery. And I was like, oh, oh. And even now, I'll be honest, you know, I probably said this in a different podcast too. Like, you know, I go to a local gym and there's a scale in the women's room. And there are days when it's like, hi, hi there. Hey. Don't you want to come in, have, you know, sit down for a while. Have, uh -huh. and, it's, and I, and, and how I look at it now in my healing space is, okay, this is another opportunity for me to strengthen this muscle that I don't need that because that does not determine my worth, mm -hmm. my value. Yeah. And quite frankly, if I stepped on that and saw a number that I wasn't comfortable with, it could potentially derail all this work that I've done. So I think that, yeah, getting rid of the scale is part and parcel of, you know, what we engage in. And, and that's a process. Some, some folks will just bring it to us and give it to mm -hmm. us and we'll hold on to it to them. Sometimes they want to take it back, yeah. you know, yeah. sometimes they give it to us, then they go out and buy a new one. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I say to folks, be honest, when you step on the scale, let's talk about that. Like, yeah. and let's think about what was coming up in you. You know, let's talk about like, 
what what led up to you stepping on the scale? What was what was the thing that was um, what were the thoughts coming up, the emotions coming up? What were you feeling in your body? Right. Mm -hmm. Because like once we get to understand the full scope of of the ways that our bodies, our minds, our our emotional centers, if you will, how they are showing up and have so much to tell us about how we're feeling. And we've been so cut off from them, you yeah. know, so admitting to using symptoms, admitting to things that maybe you don't want to admit to helps us then to be able to do the work around. Okay. So let's look at the signs that came up that maybe we missed yeah. and what can we do to give you support around them in the future? Yeah. And along with the scale conversation, there's also that, you know, purchasing clothes or finding clothes that yes. feel comfortable on your changing, changing body, right? Because that yeah. can be a trip. I know we've talked about it on previous podcasts, but so important. And there is a level of privilege in that of being able to go out and buy new clothes in different sizes, which we totally understand. And when you can find clothes, whether it's just like sweatshirts and leggings for a while so that you can get used to what it feels like to actually feel comfortable in clothing, it can be really game changing. I agree. Yeah. Clients of mine who I work with, we, we sometimes work just with clothes in sessions, mm -hmm. right? Like we'll go through the closet together and like work on trying on clothes and what that's what that process is like or what does it mean to let go of clothes that no longer fit us as mm -hmm. opposed to keeping them in the closet just in case right yeah yeah but yeah and and you're right it is an issue of privilege and i think this is this is a tricky area right because like mm -hmm. on the one hand you know most of us don't have this unlimited budget to go out and buy new clothes every time our body changes mm -hmm. on the other hand if we're just providing ourselves with clothing that maybe we wouldn't buy otherwise, what does that say? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think like, it's finding that balance. And I talk with my clients too, about like, you know, if, if, if brand new clothes are not in your budget, can we look at things like Poshmark or yep. local consignment stores where you can buy some good quality stuff that feels good on your body and, and you're, you're treating yourself to that and honoring that your body deserves to wear nice clothes. Mm -hmm regardless of the size. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And thank God now there's a lot more availability of a variety of clothing for people at all different sizes, but yeah. you know, there still is the issue of accessibility when it Absolutely. comes to some of these extended size collections are expensive. Yeah. And yeah. it's hard to imagine, you know, so, so, okay, I'm, I'm in recovery and I'm going to be gaining weight there. Like the acceptance around that like takes time. Right. But when you get there thinking, oh crap, every time I go up a size, I have to buy a whole new wardrobe, right? It can, that in and of itself can make you freeze and say like, uh, -uh I can't, I can't yeah. do that. I can't afford that. And it's like, just, can we go one step at a time? Maybe it's not yeah. a whole new wardrobe. Maybe yeah. it's staples. Maybe yeah. it's just what you need to get through this season until yeah. you can figure out how you want to dress your body. Exactly. What I started to work with was um, looking at it from the point of view of a capsule wardrobe, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, standard practice of capsule wardrobe is you buy like a really like swanky, expensive thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. and you invest in it. It's investment clothing, but whatever. So, <laughs> you know, like I'm going to spill something on it, even if it fits yes. me for the rest of my life, right? Like, <laughs> like this, I don't even know what this is. This is a new shirt. And like, it's not wet. It's just something. I don't know. <laughs> right. I've had it right. for two hours. <laughs> it's so true, right? Like, but you can. So, so that's what I did is, is, you know, as I, as I've been in this process, I'm like, okay, so what are those staple things? Like you said, leggings, like some tunics or sweatshirts where you can kind of like move around in a few sizes and they're still going to work for you. And then mm -hmm. you can add to it and like, you know, buy a couple of things that, in that size that you feel comfortable in that are affordable and, and, you know, bring them into it. So it's something as simple as like black pants, you know, or leggings, you know, if, if you want to have a nice pair of like dress pants that are pull on, like now they have yoga pants that look like dress pants, like yeah. just wear stretchy stuff. I mean, hell yeah. the pandemic, if it taught us nothing, you know, and if we remember what it taught us, which is yeah. more of the issue, you know, yeah. it's that like, I don't want to work feeling all uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Be comfortable in your body. And, and for that reason, you know, buy clothes that are going to be comfortable. And I'm thinking too of just like doing things anyway. And uh, what I mean, I think is 
a lot of times we say, I'll start yes. X, Y, Z when I lose 10 pounds. I'll start, you know, going mm -hmm. to the painting class when mm -hmm. I feel more comfortable in my body mm -hmm. and being seen or whatever it is. And this, of course, sounds like, of course, yeah, just do that. It's hard. I get it. And being able to acknowledge, like, I want to just hide away and not do uh -huh. anything. And I'm going to do the things anyway. I'm going to move my body in ways that feel joyful and connecting, even if I don't feel comfortable moving my body the way that it is, right? Or I'm going to, you know, date. I'm going to go on dates. I'm going to put myself out there. And I'm terrified mm -hmm. that I'm going to be rejected. And mm -hmm. I'm going to do it anyway. Like not yeah. putting life on hold until a certain number. In each season, your body's going to be different. And if you can start proving to yourself that like, it's okay in the here and now, that's really powerful. Yeah. And it just, and that, that becomes the narrative, mm -hmm. right? Cause we are rewriting the narrative, right? Yes. And so the, the automatic narrative right now is that weight gain is bad. My body changing is bad. You know, all of that stuff. This, every time we practice going out there and just claiming our lives for ourselves, regardless of where we're at is an opportunity to reframe and rewrite that narrative. Yeah. And you do that enough times and then it, the narrative comes, you know, it's just like, it's, it's written in you much yeah. more than it was ever. At first it feels foreign. It feels, you know, strange. It feels like you're speaking a language with which you're unfamiliar, but yeah. And we have to create safety around those mm -hmm. exposures as well. Right. And that's where, you know, work with a therapist, dietitian, support groups can really help with those exposures because it's going to take some time before, you know, I, let's not expect that you're going to walk out the door to go to this thing that you haven't mm -hmm. gone to for years and be okay with it in yeah. all ways, shapes, and forms. It's going to yeah. suck. It's going to be hard, but the more we do it, the more we want to do it yeah. and the easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then sinking yourself into, you know, say you go out to lunch with a friend, right? You reconnect mm -hmm. and it feels really good and you're engaged and you're connected. And there's just this like, huh, like I can just be. Yeah. It feels just like so important to, to like mm -hmm. remember that, to hold mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. that's what's real, right? It's mm -hmm. coming back to why people are in my life, why people are connected to me, how they make me feel, how I make them feel, right? Mm -hmm. What's in that is what's real. And yeah. that like critical voice in the back of your head saying, no one will ever accept me. No one will ever love me. This is bad. This is gross. Whatever it is. Can you hold both of like, hey, little critical voice, check this out. I just went out yeah. to lunch with Laura and we laughed and we talked for hours and it just felt so good. Like, yeah. look at what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. And not once did we talk about food or diet right. culture stuff. Like there's so much more. I, I think I probably said this on a different podcast, but like, I remember my best friend, like once I got into recovery and like, I was really into this work and like kind of woke up to, oh my gosh, it, my whole life I've been living in this nightmare, right. Without even knowing it. And she was like, I never got people. I never got people who talked about this stuff like extensively, like would want to talk about their food choices over lunch and like what diet they were on and what this and that and how they're cut. And she was like, there are so many more interesting things about us women, especially, you know, how many tables have we sat at? And I think that's, and I know, I think you and Abby talked about boundaries in a different podcast, which I yeah. certainly recommend to listen to that, but it is also about, you know, finding a way to advocate for yourself, whether it's, I'm going to step out of some situations where I know that people are going to be bringing that up, not because I'm depriving myself of it because I don't feel strong enough right now. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I feel, or I feel like I need a more supportive environment to mm -hmm. give that to myself, but also then finding ways as well to find your voice and to be able to say, listen, like, this is not okay. Can we please not talk about this and move on to something else? Yeah. Um, and I think Abby did a really good job of, of talking more about that. But that's hard, too. It is hard. It is hard. And then the grief that's attached to all of it, right? I think we, have, of course, have to name that. Um, there's so much grief in losing a body that you felt held so much value mm -hmm. and so much, you know, meaning to you to lose that and to lose, you know, like the shitty comments that are actually really shitty about like how, quote unquote, good you look. Or yep. you know, what are you doing when really you're struggling with an eating disorder, right? There's so much wound up in that loss and the loss of looking at the culture and saying, 
like, oh shit, this isn't changing anytime soon. Like we're trying, but there's a lot of grief in looking at like, yeah, this resilience that you're developing internally. It's important and it really sucks that you have to develop it all at the same yeah. time. Yeah. And it's okay to feel angry about that. Mm -hmm. It's okay to feel frustrated about that. Let's talk about that too. Like we don't, yeah. how, you know, so much of... <laughs> When we numb out, we're not feeling any of these feelings yeah. and, and feeling the feelings isn't just about feeling the good feelings, right? It's about feeling all of them. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we work on doing that in a way that's approachable and, and safe. I think that at the end of the day, we can look at it as, you know, we can get stuck in the anger and be like, you know, this, this world freaking sucks because I have to do this and like screw everyone and blah, 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 blah. And some of us are, I mean, the trope of the um, fat, angry woman often mm -hmm. comes up when I'm working with clients. Yeah. And so they, no one ever wants to in any way, give anyone any ammunition around that, if you will, like yeah. any evidence that they fit that criteria. Yeah. And so we don't talk about those those parts of us that are angry or frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, at least in the safety of the therapeutic environment, need to address those things too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yes, of course you're angry. Like I'm angry too, right? Like look at the, look at, look at what we're up against. Like we should be yeah. angry externally, yeah. right? It's like all the anger you've pointed internally all these years, like what would it be like to throw it where it belongs, right? Point yeah. it to the people, to the systems, to all of the things that are in place that we really need yeah. to be angry about. Yeah. I was, I was like, so let's harness that. Right. Like, cause anger, like, and it's, a, it's, there's energy there. Right. Mm -hmm. So anger, you know, we think about fight or flight, right. Anger gives us that ability to fight. Right. So how do we, how do we honor your anger? Let you feel it. But is there also a way sometimes to harness that anger in such a way to say, you know what? I, I can take this energy and I can transform it into energy that is empowering mm. energy that allows me to step back into my life and reclaim my life and to say, you know what, I don't need, I don't need to carry this anger anymore in that way because that takes away from our lives too, but I still need to have the time to sit with it. Yeah. And yeah, I could sit here for the rest of my life and be like, you know, this world fucking sucks. And blah, 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 blah. Why do I have to mm. do this? And like, yeah, 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 yeah. But who's that hurting? I mean, it's, right. it's hurting me. It's not, it's not helping anything. So yeah, to, to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to just honor and accept that that's how this world is, mm -hmm. that I will do what I can in my own ways with my gifts to change it as I'm able, whether it's my little small corner of the world on a larger level. And I'm not going to let that dictate to me how I live my life each yeah. and every day. I'm not going to let it continue to steal life from me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there you are, right? Reclaiming your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's so much, we could do a whole nother podcast on this, right? Yeah. Maybe we will. Maybe we um, will. <laughs> yeah. I think though, to come back to weight gain, the first step is, is it's going to, your body is going to change in recovery and yes. we don't know where it will land. We have no idea. And that is, it's, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating, but it's possible to be able to live through that and to, in that process, find something much more meaningful, a, a deeper value, a deeper belief in oneself, a deeper joy. And, you know, still, you could be living in your largest body ever and still live a life that's completely different than it was when you were in your eating disorder. And yeah. All of that factors so much more into the quality of your life than the size of your body. And yeah, we're going to encounter it. There's going to be seats that we can't fit in, or there's going to be, you know, spaces that are too small, or, you know, there's going to be people who are assholes and make comments because people mm -hmm. are assholes and make comments, right? Yeah. Over time, we develop a flexibility within ourselves and a, a tolerance within, within ourselves and a strength within ourselves to be able to encounter that without letting it take from us that which we've worked so hard to build through recovery. Mm -hmm. Feels like a good place to end. What a beautiful take home. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's my take home at least. It's beautiful for me. It's helped me. Yeah. And, and if, you know, folks, 
I'd be happy to, to do, you know, to talk more. I mean, there's other things we could talk about as well. Um, and if folks want to hear more about this and talk more about this, yeah, like let us know. We're happy to engage in these discussions. If there's other topics that are on your mind as well, know that there are people here and elsewhere that get it and understand it and want to sit with you as you discern how it is you want to enter into this process of healing when you're ready. Yeah. And just to plug our practice a little bit, it's something that I think is so cool about our practice is that the bodies of our team, right? There's such diversity in the bodies. And Mm -hmm. I think that it's so beautiful because the, the, I guess the traditional, you know, expectation of eating disorder providers of what you see on the internet are thin white women. And while yes, we all are white, white women, you know, our bodies are all quite diverse, which I think Mm -hmm. is so cool. So our team, you know, gets it and in different ways, each individually, which Mm -hmm. I feel like is just really special. For sure. Yeah. I think especially, you know, for clients of mine with whom I work, you know, well, let me put it this way. I had to work extensively with my therapist, my dietitian to come to a point where I could own like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I am a fat provider and my body is still changing because Mm -hmm. I'm still in recovery. And quite frankly, because that's what bodies do. They change to adapt. They change to Mm -hmm. situations. Right. Mm -hmm. But the fact that someone can walk into a space and sit with someone who more accurately represents the body that they're in, whatever that body is, I think means a lot to a lot of people. And, And some people are scared to say that. Like, so they'll in the intake even, like they might not admit that. Or like if I have folks going into groups, um, they'll be like, is everyone just going to be like a skinny person Mm -hmm. who's talking about not eating? Because that's not my issue. Right. right? And I think it's important that we're honest about that stuff too. Like, listen, it would be really helpful for me to work with someone who looks more like me. Yeah. Yeah. If that's possible. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not in any way to say that someone who doesn't look like you couldn't help you. They would be amazing and phenomenal. But if that creates the safety and the security you need, okay, let's make sure that we take that into account. Yep. And Mm -hmm. there is a different lived experience, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my experience recovering into a thin body is vastly different than your experience recovering Mm -hmm. into a fat body. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is a difference and people, I think there is a lot of safety in that. Right. Yeah. And we, we might not have the lived experience, but we certainly have the compassion because at the end of the day, yep. at the heart of this, it's not about the food. It's not about your size. It's not about your weight. It's, it's about some really deep seated wounds within us mm-hmm. that, that need a lot of time and a lot of care and the right safe place to be able to begin to heal. Oh, well, thank you, Laura. Thank you. All right, everyone. We hope that this was helpful. There's, of course, lots that we could say about this topic. And if that would be supportive, we will carry on. So, you know, let us know. And yeah, we can we can keep chatting about this. But we'll be back next week with another episode. And until then, take good care of yourself.